Amazing Wakaki Sensei. Look at that. You won the grand prize in the Shogakukan Manga Awards. You're going to be our next rising star. The next top mangaka in all of Japan. Alongside Mitsuru Arachi and Rumiko Takahashi. I can't wait to read your next story. Wakaki Sensei. Uh, this story is lacking something. Could you try changing a few things? I think your stories have decreased in quality lately. Maybe look at what's popular. Here, I'll let you work under a popular mangaka to help you get experience. Oh, you're back, Okaki Sensei. Uh huh. You went back to your hometown of Osaka? I hope you took the time to hone your craft. Let's see what you have here and run it as a one shot. <sighs> Sorry, we published First Touch, but it didn't do well in the ratings. Maybe the next one will be a banger. Congratulations, Wakaki Sensei! Your work, Sei Kesho Abatras, will begin serialization, as expected of Shogakukan's rising star. I'm sorry to break it to you, but Sei Kesho Abatras is getting axed. <sighs> to be honest, the only reason we published you was because we needed something to fill in space for the magazine. Publishing your series was a mistake. Based on the manga series by Tamaki Wakaki, it would follow Kema Kataragi, the god of conquest, who plays Galage or dating sims, and uses his extensive knowledge to have girls fall in love with him. However, he hates the real world, including 3D girls, so he is forced to sign a contract with the devil Elsie in order to capture runaway spirits hiding in the hearts of young girls. Interesting plot premise, right? Well, the editors of Shogaku Khan's Weekly Shonen Sunday didn't think so. In a similar fate to his past series, they only chose to fill space in the magazine because there's nothing better to choose. Basically, the world God only knows was the best of the shit pile from the round of one-shots to replace series leaving the magazine. This is because shortly after Wakaki Sensei's last series, Sei Kesho Albatross, he revisited an old idea of his from one-shots to publish. This would be turned into Koishite Kamisama! and would be published in Sunday's 32nd issue of 2007. It took the premise of an otaku making girls fall in love with him using tactics from dating sims. We can see in the one shot that Kama remains very similar to his final design, but Elsie appears more voluptuous in using a scythe similar to Hakua's. The one shot focused on Mio Aoyagi, though with a different character design and surname, but loosely followed the premise of capturing souls hiding in the hearts of girls. After publishing it, the survey results from readers weren't positive at all and was considered a failure. However, in the eyes of the online community, Otaku and Gamers of Dating Sims praised the series for its terminology and extensive knowledge, which gave hope to them. They would consider the manga a god in its own right. By the end of the year, Tamaki Wakaki would be notified that his series would be picked up for serialization to the begrudging compliance of the editors. One of the complaints was the sexualization of the female characters, so Tamaki Wakaki revisited an old rough draft of Elsie to tone it down to the style she is now. Additionally, the female characters would be molded to match the style of Albatross to focus less on the sexualization. They would appear more simplistic, but this would allow for easier recreation of the characters when drawing. While he continued working on the manga, a week before the first chapter actually published, Wakaki would post a blog detailing his current circumstances. His bank account would have only less than 10,000 yen. Money is a problem for him as he was considered a neat throughout his aspirations of being a mangaka. He says that Sunday promised him a higher pay per manuscript but never followed through. He needed money to purchase equipment for the manga, such as toner, markers, and stencils, but the money in his account wouldn't be enough. With a week left until his new series starts, he had three options. Reduce the quality of the first chapter, go into debt, or cancel his pre-order of Ninja Gaiden 2. He went with option 2. Just like a student entering university, he went into debt and took out a loan. Wakake Sensei was literally betting everything on his new series. The hype of editors from previous years praising him for his award-winning skills will finally pay off when he published The World God Only Knows, otherwise known as Kami no Mizo Shuru Sekai, or Kami no Mi for short, on April 9, 2008. What would readers think of this unique series? Surprisingly, it did well. While the editors detested the series, 
Many readers enjoy the quick humor, pop culture references, and lovable characters in the first chapter. Survey responses weren't exclusively from otaku, but actually a lot of people. Heck, even popular authors like Hayate no Gotoku's Kenjiro Hata and Zetai Karen Children's Shina Takashi praised the series, looking forward to it from then on. Now that Tamiki Wakaki had the green light of success, he can work on the series at his own pace. Yet, states this is probably why Albatross was cancelled. Previously, Albatross was story-centric, with lots of foreshadowing. Wakake-sensei took a slow pace with the series since Sunday is lenient with new authors on giving them a year or so with their series to test waters. Slowly unraveling the story appeared to be its downfall, so he instead sped through many of the first arcs of Kaminomi. Each would last two to four chapters until he could guarantee safety from cancellation. These chapters would later be expanded on in the anime with original scenes that Wakaki cut or appeared in the volumes. He would solidify a pattern with an arc, then an interval chapter between to allow room for research and planning. He would not skip a day of work unless forced by the publisher since he didn't want to slack. With this, each arc would follow a girl who desires an ideal world but is disappointed with the real world. It would create a lengthy divide in the hearts of them that the loose souls would fill to continue the endless desire. Kama and Elsie would call these holes or gaps, which is a term Wakaki Sensei created to explain his philosophy of the real versus the ideal. Which brings us to... Before becoming a mangaka, Tamiki Wakaki went to Kyoto University to study. Although he never stated what he went there for exactly, he did participate in computer clubs and classes. With his love and passion for video games, it could be assumed he went in there for game design and development. I bring this up because in an interview with Kyoto University to check on past alumni, he mentions the philosophy of the real versus the ideal. This is a struggle of his as the ideal seems positive, but the real world takes away that magic and destroys it. He experienced this while attending university where he had a perception of his ideal self that other people influenced his perception on. Being considered a genius not only in academics, but shortly after becoming a mangaka at 21, winning awards and being called a rising star will make you think you are the ideal self and need to be successful. Yet, when encountered with other people who do not think that, reality sets in and you lose sight of the ideal. Wakaki-sensei became disillusioned by the praise and started losing confidence in himself, rejection after rejection. This created a gap in his heart at the time. He became a neat out of college that played video games since his idea of being a bona fide genius appeared to be a lie. He had to learn to accept the real world no matter how much he hated it and to use the ideal as a goal. He may never reach that goal, but people come for the character story, and that is what Wakaki-sensei wanted to communicate with his series. Philosophy is about ideas, and he struggled to share those ideas with words to people, so he decided to convey his ideas and manga for people to understand. That idea being the philosophy behind Tamiki Wakaki and Kaminomi. The gaps in people's hearts comes from the difference between their real self and their ideal self. Although I can simplify it into a sentence, it doesn't explain his concept entirely. Let's look at a heroine to use as an example. I did do one on Junagase already, so I shouldn't choose her. Oh, I know, Shiori Shiomiya. Not only is she best girl, in my opinion, but is the one I relate to with the most. Just like me, Shiori is extremely self-conscious about how she presents herself through words. She is quiet, timid, and doesn't speak her mind. This is her ordeal as she wants to share her thoughts orally, but finds it a struggle to do so. She will imagine herself doing things that is considered out of character, but it is to demonstrate her desire for being able to speak clearly. Thus, her real self is being shy and taciturn, while her ideal self is someone who is confident and expressive. The vast difference between the two creates a gap that allows the loose soul to inhabit and continue fostering negative emotions. If you consider the loose soul as a representation of something, whether it be depression, desire, or despair, this will explain the gap and amount of feeling someone can have. Yet, that is a manifestation of the person's own dilemma being unable to reach the ideal self. Let's use a real-world example of losing weight. You have a goal to lose weight, but your body holds many pounds. It can seem hopeless at first of how much work you have to put in, how much time to train, and so much more. The individual may think it won't get any better, but they won't know if they don't try. So, if they desire to become skinny and put the work towards it, 
their gap will decrease, while happiness blossoms around them. On the other hand, if they think it is impossible, they will continue living their current lifestyle to gain further weight and feel bad about themselves. Okaki-sensei is trying to argue this. While the gap is a metaphysical representation of who we want to become, it is only our ability to allow it to permeate. Just like with losing weight or a shiori trying to speak up more, they need to look at the ideal self as a goal to improve, not necessarily to obtain. People work to improve themselves in different ways, from speaking your mind, to being the best teacher, to simply being special. It is the baby steps of going forward towards the ideal self they need to work on as it will start shrinking that gap. If they fail and look back, they will dwell on the feelings to expand the gap even further. What Wakaki-sensei is conveying is that our real self is who we are and we should accept that, but never fail to strive for an ideal self. Yet our ideal self is a goal and may be something we never reach. Instead, we should care about our efforts towards the goal since the story is more important than the ending. Going back to Shiori's arc and relating it to myself, I feel like when I do speak, I don't get to the point and ramble on. When I saw Shiori as a little girl thinking about how she would enter the classroom and waiting to not interrupt class, I could painfully relate to it. Whenever I need to say thank you, whether in person or online, I would think about how I should present myself. Many of them had me being exuberant and lively, but that isn't who I was, so I didn't live up to that ideal self I created in my mind. Sometimes I would say thanks, but others I would not get the chance to say it because I kept thinking my thankfulness needed to be meaningful. I would think back persistently to how I could have done better with just a simple instance of saying thank you. Dwelling on those feelings made me miserable and didn't solve the issue. Relating to the gap philosophy, I should know that I needed to be more confident in my ability to speak instead of fumbling over ideas of how I should do that. These moments will have repercussions both for me and the other party, but you don't know among us. Since I am quiet, I sit back and observe people. I notice the small things they do. I'm not a stalker, I promise. But in Among Us, this can be useful information. I want to speak up, but I don't want to interrupt others. So I wait for them to call on me, but most times the games devolve into arguments anyway, so I don't get a chance to speak. As a result, the imposters always win because I didn't bring up information, and so... <sighs> oh my. I strayed from the script. Let's see, uh... I think I communicated clearly with a few examples. Let's talk about how it relates to me even more. Back in my Siren retrospective, I mentioned my first ever manga purchase was Volume 7 in Japanese. My second ever manga purchase was... Siren Volume 8 in Japanese. Until this time, I really only purchased Siren Volumes, but then a year later, I was able to do it. I bought the limited edition bundle of The World God Only Knows Volume 10. It covered the Hinoki arc and began to introduce Akari, but came with a special DVD showing the trailers for the anime releasing in a few weeks, and a special interview with Hiro Shimono and Kanae Ito, the voices for Kema and Elsie. From this point forward, I would buy each volume all the way up to the final one. Since many of these would be limited edition versions, I would purchase those in a heartbeat. Kaminomi would be one of the first series I started actively collecting merch for by purchasing items pertaining to my favorite character, Shiori Shiomiya. I got a plushie of her and her character song CD, as well as a poster featuring her sleeping under a tree. Oh, and I bought the fifth Blu-ray of the Japanese release featuring her as well. I don't have a problem. But the fact this series impacted me so much about items around it has to mean something, so why? Well, back in 2007 and 2008, when I was just diving into anime, I was in a rough period of my life, like most blossoming weebs. I was struggling with my gender dysphoria while presenting as something I wasn't, and then with several instances of bullying plus family drama going on, life just sucked. So I resorted to watching anime as an escape. However, I started reading manga around this time as well. I started with Siren and then Soul Eater, but mainly focused on those two. Sometimes afterwards, I picked up the world Godly knows while seeing its name constantly pop up in a recently updated list. I was curious about it, so I read it, and I instantly fell in love with it after reading the chapters available. I don't know the exact date I picked it up, but the most recent release was in the Kusunoki arc. Of course, the arc preceding that is Shiori's, who is my favorite character, I feel like I'm a broken record at this point, but its message of the real versus ideal resonated with me, although misconstrued. 
Originally, in my adolescent mind, I took it as me needing to achieve the ideal. This is extremely misguided from Wakaki Sensei's message, but I think my rationalizing at the time was that these characters needed to fulfill their ideal roles, but that wasn't the case. Although it did help urge me to come out to my family about being transgender, it created a false persona in my head of my ideal self. My real self was a quiet boy that kept to themselves and played video games so much it could be labeled as an addiction. Meanwhile, my ideal self is that of a beautiful woman who is outgoing and lively that dresses pretty and enjoys everything a girl does. I had to learn the hard way that my ideal self was nothing more than a fantasy. One of the common misconceptions I hear about the trans community, as well as from my own experience, is that changing genders would make me a different person. I change my name, my appearance, and my routines, and this somehow makes me someone different. This is practically what my ideal self amounted to, a new person. It wasn't actually me because I kept thinking I would try new things I hated, think of the world differently, and become an entirely separate entity. The truth of the matter is that my ideal self shouldn't be different from me, but actually resemble me. Just because someone thinks I changed to a new person doesn't mean that is the case. I was, and would always be, me. Although it seemed unattainable to me, I needed to learn that my ideal self is based around me. My personality, my interests, my hobbies, everything about my real self needs to be based within those parameters. The self I was idealizing was sexist following stereotypes of what society thought needed to be a girl, and I dropped my love for gaming, anime, music, everything about me that made me, me, in pursuit of this false equivalence. Basically, I wanted to be a basic bitch, but that wasn't me. I was born a girl, dressed in a boy's body, not a boy wanting to be a girl. I started to change my outlook on things as I grew older from learning more about the world, and this connected with what I read during the climax of the Heart of Jupiter arc. At some point, life became too stressful to indulge myself with things I enjoy, including watching anime and reading manga. I returned to the series in 2013 when I sped through the content I last left on at the beginning of the new arc. This arc shows Kama needing to make drastic decisions in order for him to return home, but they are extremely painful for him to do. It demonstrates the constant cycle he's been living in by repeating similar procedures with each conquest, creating a cycle of idealness. For him to escape it, he needs to exit the cycle by completing it, and the symbol of cycles is shown no better than in the opening themes. One of the things that is infamous in Kaminomi is that its full opening songs are extremely long, more so than most anime songs. This is because it is an oratorio, a musical work utilizing an orchestra and choir to perform a religious piece. It comes from the word oratory, which is a small chapel where people come to worship. This is noteworthy because whenever a religious holiday were to occur, most opera theaters would be closed, but these chapels would be open, so they would create oratorios specifically for this time of religious holidays. Most would be cycles, so that each part would be played throughout the year at certain points before returning to the start again. Think of it like seasons. It would create an endless cycle throughout the year. This connects with how the openings are oratorios. All three openings for the first season, second, and goddess arc should be combined together to hear it in its entirety. This is because what you hear at the start of the first opening returns at the end of the goddess opening. It completes the cycle by literally returning to the beginning at the end of the song with the same refrain. Several oratorios took note of this and created stories where the characters return to the beginning, suggesting an endless cycle that can't be escaped. However, when you mirror this with what comes in the manga, it seems even more poetic. The Heart of Jupiter arc is the final one in the series. It focuses on Kama going back 10 years shortly before meeting Tenri in order to start the series. Literally, he has a pedestal with a four-lined ore that holds resets for him in this past timeline, yet if he fails to reach a goal, he is done. Obviously, it resembles that of a video game where you have four lives to beat it, but you don't get another chance outside of them. It goes back to the original concept of Kama needing to make a girl fall in love with him to make the runaway spirit leave her heart. The girl loses her memories, for the most part, and then Kama goes on to the next one, 
It repeats the same cycle day in and day out, with the differences being the root and the girl. It follows a similar pattern regardless. In order for Kama to escape the cycle, he needs to grow himself and learn from his journey. He does this by starting the cycle. Spoilers, but Kama's mission is to set up the events in the story for his future self to complete, although unbeknownst to him at the time. He needs to open the gaps in the girl's hearts himself, which will not only allow the devils to place spirits in those gaps, but they will cover for the goddesses lurking inside the girl. Thus, he sets the gears in motion for him to begin the story with the trigger of Elsie becoming his buddy, complete conquest, say the goddesses, and then return to the start of it to repeat the cycle. It is only after the cycle can he truly be free, as well as to engage with the real world and become serious. The most important thing is the last line is, come find us. Referencing Kama needing the search for the goddesses, which was his original mission in the series, not just a bunch of conquests. Thus, Kaminomi's opening returns to the beginning to create the cycle just like an oratorio. Another note is that the first oratorios focus on people interacting with gods, where it seemed like a fantastical and ideal world. Although I do not know if Okaki sensei did it intentionally, it seems that Kaminomi was created with regards to oratorios, most notably a specific oratorio. What I am about to say is mere speculation, but it is apparent Wakaki sensei not only loves music, but created several pieces for the series. He wrote lyrics in the manga himself, which is also evident in his next series, King of Idol, but collaborated with the staff for the anime to deliver the heart and soul of the series. So I think he has knowledge and is aware of oratorios pertaining to Kaminomi, where he had inspiration from the most famous oratorio, Joseph Hayden's The Creation. This masterpiece is a retelling of God creating the world in the book of Genesis, using voices and instruments to melodically communicate its creation. Its connection to Kaminomi is that it mirrors the goddess arc in plot structure and symphony. While I could spend literal hours dissecting their symmetry, since the creation is actually two hours long, the shorthand is that both span seven days with a prologue introducing the conflict and a seventh day being the epilogue. Each day has a chord repeating throughout for the specific day with the same repeating beat throughout. In the creation, this is the use of strings for God's creations. While in The Secrets of the Goddess, it is the snare drum playing in the background for all goddess parts. Plus, just like the creation, when switching perspectives from a heavenly being to a mortal one, the keys shift. The highly goddesses sing in D major further up on the scale, while Kama's parts fall into D minor, representing either his own mortality or the fact he needs to become a devil to revive the goddesses. In the creation, it is God himself, then his archangels, and then Adam and Eve, his final creation to the world. Although the creation isn't like most oratorios that actually cycle through, it does so in a poetic sense. The start focuses on devils running the world before God said, let there be light. And it ends with Adam and Eve praising God just before they incite the fall of humanity by eating the devil's fruit, allowing devils to ruin God's creation once more. This can mirror events in the world God only knows overall but is definitely attuned with the goddess arc. God bears his creation only to have it ruined again by devils, just like the opening oratorio cycle through to create a world only Kama knows, the world God only knows. Tamiki Iwakaki Sensei created the world God only knows to convey a philosophy he concocted that emerged from his life struggle of becoming a mangaka after college. He wouldn't get to start his own series until nearly 15 years after earning the Shogaku Khan Award, and that would be cancelled due to him being put in for filler space as a mistake on part of the editors, when they did the same once again with his new series to fill space. While the editors didn't have high hopes for the series, 
while Kaki Sensei would prove them wrong, where it would become one of the magazine's flagship series and thus would be the greatest mistake they created in a positive light. While Kaki Sensei poured sweat and tears into the world God only knows, where he took very little breaks and would participate heavily in the anime's production with storyboarding, music composition, writing, and more. It is a series that means very much to him and the myriad of fans around the world. It is a shame he hasn't gotten the same praise of his new series he started, although his recent one he is currently publishing is popular enough to warrant an emergency reprint of Volume 1. Hopefully it can reach a similar status as Kaminomi. On a more personal level, it helped me realize to improve myself and not chase after a false ideal in my head. It introduced me to a slew of characters I love and enjoy that are dear to my heart. Plus, one of the few things I remember from my college music theory class is the Oratorio's history and development. I had the biggest epiphany when I connected the two together, which is a great way to learn. With that out of the way, from me and a whole world of fans that God only knows, thank you, Tamiki Wakaki-sensei, for creating a magnificent series and a happy 10-year anniversary of the anime to you. Thank you.